here we go. I'm not sure what is working. It's working. No, but it's all right. Okay. Uh, welcome to the uh, computer security seminar from uh, uh, Purdue University. Uh, of course, if you are here in the um, um, room, you already know that we're at uh, Purdue University. However, uh, this is also uh, uh, this is also being webcast. Uh, today's speaker is uh, uh, Jason Crampton. He's from the uh, Information Security Group at uh, Royal Holloway of the uh, University of London, and he he um, will speak today on. Uh, at uh, at um, at uh, administrative uh, scope and uh, ro role based at uh, administration. Jason, thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and um, I'd like to thank Professor Bettina for her kind invitation to speak here. Um, it's uh, not every day you get to talk at such a um, prestigious uh, university. So um, I hope I uh, do give you an interesting presentation. So I'm, I'm going to talk about um, some work I did while I was doing my doctorate, um, which subsequently got published uh, in ACM Transactions on Information Systems Security. <coughs> um, and it's, um, it's about an administrative model for role-based access control. Uh, and it was motivated by my um, study of AR back 97, which is, which at the time was the only administrative model for role-based access control. And I felt it had a number of shortcomings, and um, I set out to address those. And uh, I guess you can judge whether I've been successful or not. Um, so <clears throat> this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just briefly explain what access control is. Um, this will be very brief, because uh, I'm sure most of you already know. But just so, just so you know where I'm coming from with access control. Um, <clears throat> and just a little bit about why we need to have an administrative model at all. Then I'll talk about administrative scope, which is uh, the building block for um, a variety of models that I developed for role-based access control. Um, then um, talk about this admin authority relation, which is used to enrich the idea of administrative scope. And um, finally talk about how this is used for role-based administration, how you administer the role hierarchy and how you make changes to the assignment of users and permissions to roles. Then, um, depending on time, um, I'm, I'm, I thought I had an hour, but I've only got 45 minutes. So um, some of these later sections may get truncated or omitted altogether. But I will try and give you some kind of feeling for why I think um, one of the models I developed is better than AR back 97. And I'll also talk a little bit, if I have time, about more complex role-based access control models and how we might administer those. Okay, so access control, um, I'm sure you all know this, but it's really a mechanism to ensure that only the right users get to use computer resources. Now, of course, if, if you don't care who accesses your resources, you don't need access control. Um, and the early standalone PCs were, didn't bother with it. Um, it's really in uh, um, file sharing situations and network computers and stuff that you need some kind of access control. And um, we have it to limit access, as I already suggested, to sensitive information. And it works by associating users with certain resources and access rights, those, those resources and, and those ways of accessing those resources that they're entitled to. <coughs> and uh, in a little bit more detail, a user gets authenticated and at that stage is provided with some kind of security context. Um, it varies from uh, operating system to application to whatever. But typically, you'll get some kind of security identifier bound to that user. And that identifier is used 
to establish uh, whether a user request to access some resource is allowed. And it does it by comparing the object identifier in the request with the subject identifier, the, the user's identifier, and uh, depending on the mechanism that's involved, like access control lists or whatever, will uh, result in a decision of that access control query. So that's, um, roughly speaking, what I take access control to be. Um, so as a, as a concrete example, which I'm sure you're all aware of, there's a very famous model uh, from the early sort of mid-70s called the protection matrix model. And um, basically, you arrange users, well, proxies for users, subjects they usually refer to, more modern terminology is perhaps principles. Uh, you have a matrix, a two-dimensional array, indexed by subjects and objects, the resources that you want to protect, and the entries in the matrix indicate what access is permitted uh, by that subject for that object. So uh, an access request is typically modeled as a triple. This subject wants to access this object in a particular way, so I might want to read a particular file, for example. And this request is permitted if that access right is in the corresponding matrix entry. Very simple sort of idea. And this model has, has proved surprisingly long-lived and provides a theoretical basis for things like access control lists, which we see in modern operating systems. <clears throat> now, um, we'll turn to the sort of focus of this talk, which is administration. What, what does this mean? Well, at any particular point in time, you have um, a snapshot of the authorization, authorization information in the system. And you might refer to this as configuration or state. It depends which papers you read. Um, it was introduced by Bell Lapidula um, because they wanted to have a, a state transition model, essentially. So it was important to see how these states evolved over time. These states evolved by changing aspects of the authorization information. So in the context of protection matrix model, you might add an entry to the matrix, for example. <clears throat> so um, unless you have some notion of changing state, um, the, the, you, you've got a static system, and it, it becomes impossible to add users, add resources, or change the access rights available to users. So you really need to have some way of changing state. And uh, I'm going to use administration as a generic sort of term for doing this, for changing components of the system. Um, so again, if, if, you, if you never need to change your security configuration, then you don't need administration. But typically, you will need that, and you will need some kind of administrative model which controls updates to these various access control data structures. So again, just going back to the protection matrix model, the dynamic components in this model would include the set of subjects. You might want to add a new user, for example, or indeed delete one. A set of objects, you might want to add resources or delete them. And also elements in the matrix. You might want to add the privilege to read a file, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or indeed take them away. Um, the set of access rights is assumed to be static in the protection matrix model. And now administration is, is achieved, or changes to state are achieved by commands. Uh, they're, they're basically, you can imagine them just as, as C-style function calls or whatever, and these just change um, the matrix. And this, is, again, is assumed for any given system, is assumed to be fixed. So the set of commands is static, set of access rights is static, but these other aspects, the, the matrix entries, set of subjects, set of objects, are assumed to be dynamic. So just as an example, you might want to transfer an, an access right A from one subject uh, S to another subject T. So